वेलकम टू गजाली टुडे वी हैव अ वेरी वेरी इंटरेस्टिंग गेस्ट विनायक भरने इन माय ओपिनियन आई थिंक वन ऑफ द सन्स ऑफ गोवा टू बी प्राउड ऑफ इन गोवा वी हैव अ लॉट ऑफ राइस फील्ड्स दे सो राइस द प्लांट्स द सैपलिंग ग्रोज बट इफ यू जस्ट लिव इट देयर इट डजेंट गिव गुड फ्रूट इट हैज टू बी ट्रांसप्लांटेड एंड ओनली देन इट सॉर्ट ऑफ गिव्स गुड राइस द सेम वे पर हैप्स it is very interesting that somebody is transplanted somewhere else vinayak did his graduation in goa college of architecture he had a short scholarship of asia pacific scholarship to japan then went to uh, california did his masters in urbanism and today he is considered to be one of the major urbanist of the world he has received lots of awards uh, some of the most prestigious award for environmental protection in america he has authored four books he is a teacher talking about urbanism all over the world he has been associated with planning of townships in america in japan in africa in iran in uh, <coughs> in panama in uh, brazil and i think i think we all go and should be really very very proud of him and uh, it is a great opportunity that he is here so vinayak welcome and uh, let's sort of uh, apprise the audience about what is the role of urbanist well first of all subod before i say anything i just have to say what an honor it is to sit here with you i grew up in goa for 20 years admiring your work but i never thought there would be a day when we would sit on tv and chat about cities so this so is very pleasure, special pleasure <laughs> So now I'll answer your question. Uh, I think everyone knows what an architect does, particularly in Goa. But uh, very few people think of an urban planner in a very clear way. The idea of what urban planning is is very ambiguous all over the world. I think primarily because urban planners deal with things that you don't see very easily. Uh, they deal with policy, uh, behind the scenes frameworks that change cities, which is not very easy and not very enticing. but i think there is now over the last uh, 30 years or 20 years a very emergent field particularly in the united states and europe which is urbanism and i think the best way to describe it is, is it is a bridge between architecture and policy mm-hmm. so urbanism uh, is usually a set of people who may or may not have architecture backgrounds you don't have to but they have enough knowledge that deal with both the tangible aspects of cities which is urban form mm-hmm. buildings bridges infrastructure but they also understand very deeply the processes and the instruments that affect mm-hmm. physical form uh, so so uh, i was trained as an architect mm-hmm. and i went to the us and met some people there that began to influence me mm-hmm. and then began to realize that uh, cities are not really made by architects mm-hmm. at all architects play a role in many times cities. they are very often spoil cities <laughs> well we we i think across the world there has been a lot of damage that has been done by architects to mm-hmm. cities but i think the bigger culprit that we should talk about is the system mm-hmm. that has allowed them to do this mm-hmm. i don't think it is fair mm-hmm. for to no, point no, fingers at the architects because in many times when you see many buildings which don't belong i personally feel very angry i want to take a gun and shoot normally i'm not a not a very violent man but it's what comes but tell me now uh, can you describe one of your projects which is dear to you and what were the different interventions which you were proud of well i think for example the best way to answer that question is Uh, I think the challenge of any project is when you have a system that doesn't really al- allow you to penetrate it very easily. Mm-hmm. And uh, in most in the United States, let's talk of the US where most of my work is uh it's a very regulated society. So law means a lot. Reinforcement is uh, everything. There's a lot mm-hmm. of transparency. So what we've been doing in the US on a very global scale which is a lot of the work i do is to uh, along with others of course is to talk about what is not working well and try to change it now that's a difficult uh, thing to do because it takes a hell of a long time for example specifically zoning mm-hmm. uh, zoning is a very influential instrument that affects cities on a very big scale mm-hmm. 
uh, because zoning is the law through which development specifics. Zoning uh, meaning zone of education, zone of market size. Uh, yeah, it is both the designations of the city as well as the specific bylaws mm -hmm. that tell you how tall a building can be, what density is allowed, mm -hmm. floor area ratio, all okay. that kind of stuff. Now, if you look at what has happened in the U.S. over the last 50 years or so, uh, we have gotten what is called sprawl. Now, mm -hmm. Sprawl is where cities are largely designed for cars. Mm -hmm. uh, you have streets that, by law, are designed to be very wide mm -hmm. for speeding cars, mm -hmm. uh, not necessarily for pedestrians. Uh, you have suburbs where you drive long distances from where you work, mm -hmm. which creates a lot of traffic jams and all kinds mm -hmm. of things. Now. This began in the 20s and the 30s, but at that time nobody thought we would reach a stage where the champagne would burst open and you would create all these problems. Mm -hmm. But we live in a state today where uh, cities like Los Angeles, for example, are getting terribly congested. Mm -hmm. All over the world this is happening. So there's an increasing uh, body of professionals mm -hmm. uh, to which I belong, which campaign for uh, reforming the system in whatever way we, f we feel appropriate. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the most interesting project types that we are doing in many cities, which is a very difficult thing to do, is change zoning. Mm -hmm. And so how do you change zoning to bring in another model of city making? Mm -hmm. And that's been the challenge. So for example, you have transportation departments in American cities that have worked like this for, you know, half a century mm -hmm. and they're not willing to take anything but business as usual. Okay. So how do you go in and transform it? Mm -hmm. So what I'm saying is projects like this are as much about political navigation mm -hmm. uh, as about uh, architectural thinking, mm -hmm. as, as, as much about uh, strategic mm -hmm. economic development and so on mm -hmm. and so forth. Mm -hmm. And that is what city planning is really about. Mm -hmm. it, is, it is not uh, one thing only, it's a multidisciplinary. You made a very interesting point in your article where you said that okay, planning should not be coming from the top. Like in Goa, in Panjim, we had this example where Imagine Panjim, where a Spanish company was asked to give a plan to us, and they give, give the plan. And uh, you talked about basically everybody getting involved. Can you elaborate a bit on that? Everybody is an mm -hmm. urbanist, was your statement. Yeah, I think it should be pretty obvious that mm -hmm. we are all urbanists. I think we all have a role to play in mm -hmm. the making of cities. Uh, I don't think there's anything wrong with foreign consultants coming and, mm -hmm. you know, doing plans. I think an expert of any sort is an expert. But, uh, so, but I think whether it's Imagine Panjim, well, I don't know much about Imagine Panjim, but I think the important thing for people to recognize is foreign consultants or local consultants will come. They will do plans to the best of their ability, mm -hmm. but then they will pack their bags and they will go away. Mm -hmm. I think the people who will really live the plan mm -hmm. is the locals after the consultants are gone. Mm -hmm. now what does that mean? That means that your plan has to be so intelligent mm -hmm. that it can leave the local people mm -hmm. with a clear understanding of what it is, mm -hmm. number one, mm -hmm. a clear understanding of how to change it if things are not working, mm -hmm. uh, and even more, a understanding that it's not perfect mm -hmm. and that they will have to adapted over time, uh, which intrinsically implies that it cannot be written by a foreigner. It cannot yeah. be written. You cannot have a plan that is authored by mm -hmm. one entity. So process becomes very important. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think the best plans uh, are usually very transparent. They are done where locals who have a much deeper knowledge of their cities anyway and understand the problems of their cities anyway, mm -hmm are intrinsic partners in mm -hmm. part of the process. Where the foreign consultant comes in is because largely of their knowledge and skill in technical issues mm -hmm. or precedents that have worked in other cities. Mm -hmm. But how actually to adapt it, what cautions to take, mm -hmm. I think the people of that city really have the answers. Yeah. So what I'm saying in effect is any plan, whether it's Imagine Panjim or anything else, mm -hmm. should be written by many authors mm -hmm. with a foreign consultant as one part mm -hmm of the authorship. Mm -hmm. right? That is yeah. very important, I think. Yeah, I read in your article some of the very interesting uh, interventions. For example, there was in, in Brazil, this lighthouses, which were made, yes. many lighthouses. Can you in tell Curitiba. us a bit more about it? Yeah, well, this is a this fascinating is a city called? Uh, Curitiba. 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 Curitiba is a city that is very famous for its bus rapid transit, mm -hmm. which has become world famous. But what a lot of people don't know is uh, it was it was a it's a poor city, it's not a very affluent city, which is very applicable to a lot of places in India. Mm -hmm. 
what happened is the neighborhoods in the city were very crime infested and the level of education and literacy was very low. Mm -hmm. So in cities like that, top-down reform usually has very limited effect because mm -hmm. reinforcement is ambiguous, politics is very mm -hmm. murky. What, what the government did, to their credit, was they initiated a very modest little set of interventions called Lighthouses of Knowledge. I'm okay. translating it to uh -huh. Spanish. But yeah. And what they did was they had these almost art installations, if you mm -hmm. can call it, which was basically you go into a poor neighborhood mm -hmm. and you, you put a beautiful lighthouse. lighthouse, but below the lighthouse is a tiny room. Mm -hmm. In that room is an internet cafe, a small library, uh, maybe, maybe a computer. Mm -hmm. Now, w once you plant it in a, in a uh, neighborhood that is not so rich, all of a sudden it becomes 10 things in one. It yeah. becomes a piece of art which gives the community identity. Yeah. The children can come and hang out and get an internet cafe. Uh, you know, you, the library becomes a place for the elderly people mm -hmm. as well as youngsters to go and mm -hmm. educate. And it is an important case study because it has spawned an enormous renaissance in Kuruchiba mm -hmm. neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. it, has cre it has shot up the literacy rates, mm -hmm. the literacy rate and brought down the crime rate mm -hmm. by uh, proportions. I wish we could have something like that, lighthouses like of knowledge in Goa. <laughs> I think what is nice about it is it, it, it shows you that mm -hmm. uh, city reform yeah. uh, is as much about urban art, yeah. uh, as much about mm -hmm. strategic thinking, mm -hmm. as much about uh, uh, bottom up, mm -hmm. as much about citizen will. There's no one definition of how you can create urban reform in any part of the world. Uh, um, one of the books which you wrote uh, is. Uh, about uh, place in Iran. In Goa, we have 120 inches of rainfall. And in spite of 120 inches of rainfall, we have water shortage. So it really requires excellence in mismanagement of water. <laughs> and in Iran, you mentioned about this place where there is no lake, no water supply, but yet a city grew. And I think it was very fascinating. Can you enlighten? Yes. Uh, well, the water shortage issue in places of abundant rain is uh, in theory, a com com complete absurdity, I think, but uh, it is happening all across the world. Um, Iran is a desert, so it's a completely different case. They have a complete paucity of, of rainfall. And I was studying Iranian cities because they are very interesting to me personally. And as I was doing these studies, I came across a town called Yazd, Y-A-Z-D, Z-D. Yazd. Yazd. Mm -hmm. He has this uh, World Heritage uh, uh, town because the urban core of the town is very famous for its mud houses, and the mud houses have cooling towers. Mm -hmm. And this is what we had known Yazd for. But what surprised me is that the town was not located near any water body. There was no lagoon, there was no sea, and there was no river. Most of the other big cities in Iran are located next to rivers. So I began to investigate how the city sustained itself. It was kind of a puzzle. And we realized that 10 kilometers away are the Zagros Mountains. The Zagros Mountains get snow every year, mm -hmm. and the snow percolates into the ground and creates an aquifer. Yeah. And what these people had done 3,000 years ago is from the aquifer, about 10, 20, or 50 feet below the ground, mm -hmm. they had created these underground channels of water, which